Hi folks, this is the last lecture of chemistry and mass at least for this semester. The next lecture on Thursday, I think, or Friday, will be me just going through your complete examination set, one of the past sets from 2017 and 2018. I will just take an examination paper and I'll solve it on the board in 45 minutes with explanations. You will have two hours for it, so that's an indication that that's actually quite realistic. So the next lecture is quite important. You'll be getting examples of what awaits you in the exam. But today is the second lecture in this course. The first one was artificial intelligence, the ones that you've watched on YouTube with the builders in the background. Uh, but this is the other lecture that is not um, tied to any particular problem set, but it is tied to reality that awaits you when you become chemist. This lecture is about defending your data, and it is about detecting deterioration in the data storage medium. So practical examples of where this could occur, you will all go on to do great things. Uh, for example, in forensics, like chemical forensics is very important. In places like, uh, I don't know, Olympic Games, you have all heard about the doping scandals where various uh, people from various countries have been eating this and that. And we are talking nanograms of those substances, and in the case where the samples test positive, there will be whole countries that wouldn't particularly like hearing them. Or in the case of those unfortunate poisoned Russians a couple of years ago, just over here in Salisbury, we are talking micrograms of substance. And again, there are whole powerful nations that would rather not want anyone to know. So you will have, at some point, to appear uh, as uh, a witness in court, and you will be asked uh, the standard question of how do you know your data have not been tampered with. And today's lecture is about data being tampered with, data deteriorating. And um, when it deteriorates on its own, it's fairly benign, but you should be prepared to defend your data from highly skilled individuals seeking to interfere it. Uh, either they would hack into your computer, or in the case of the United States, they would simply have a back door into it. And then again, you have to make sure that your data stays in the way that you then stand up to scrutiny. So the first item of our agenda today is how data goes wrong. So what happens in a computer? So they together. And there are several standard ways in which things go wrong. The most obvious one is just mechanical or electrical failure. Where somewhere in a RAM chip, for example, RAM capacitors, roughly speaking, um, the two plates of the capacitor became fused. You know that uh, the dynamic memory of modern computers is just a combination of capacitors and transistors. And in the case when there is an electric short circuit inside the <coughs> capacitor, you will lose that particular bit. Uh, or the cable can go jump somewhere, or a mouse has gone through it. Not an uncommon occurrence, I can assure you. Particularly with all the cabling and cranking that we've got in around in this university, so rats can be a problem. <coughs> um, so things like that. So obvious electrical or mechanical problems. Uh, then there's media degradation. Magnetic tapes uh, were notorious for this because tape was made out of polymer materials onto which iron or chromium oxide was then somehow attached. And uh, the plastic slowly loses its flexibility, so it will crack. Um, it can chemically degrade in high temperatures if there's high concentration of solvent vapors in the atmosphere, like it would be in most chemical laboratories. 
you would have the plastic media in great over time. A good example are standard uh, five inch and three inch floppy disks, uh, of which you probably haven't seen many, uh, but I've been using them a lot. Those things degraded in a matter of weeks. So you put it into the disk reader, and it's a pretty mechanical device. Uh, you go into the chemistry laboratory a couple of weeks of sitting on your table, that thing is no longer able. So this is uh, something that is going to happen. And then we've got the more uh, exotic things, uh, things called bit clips. <coughs> and those come from a variety of sources. So let's say you've got a magnetic surface, and on that magnetic surface, the uh, magnetic head of some hard disk has a coded pattern of bits. And these clips can actually be spontaneous on the length, scale, and the time scale of these processes, quantum mechanical effects operate to a significant extent. These are nanometer size domains in magnetic media. It is not impossible, although unlikely, that the bit would flip spontaneously. So a magnetic domain in the media would reorient. And obviously, because of the Arrhenius law, you know that the probability of this increases exponentially with temperature. So at high temperature, 50, 70, and so on, the likelihood of spontaneous increases. increases. Uh, funnily enough, uh, the second uh, most common reason for this uh, historically was discovered quite recently in the 70s, if memory serves, when computer scientists looking at sources of these clips noticed that the servers located in the attic of their building were generating a lot more memory flip errors per unit time than the servers that were located in the basement. And they realized that one of the most common sources of these clips is cosmic rays. These can be extremely energetic. Many orders of magnitude more energetic than the stuff we can generate in Large Hadron Collider. There's a famous proton that entered the atmosphere uh, at some point in the 70s that has the energy of a baseball ball. So a single elementary particle with an energy of about a couple of joules. So quite what had accelerated to those sorts of energies, we will probably never know. But what happens when this thing hits um, any uh, memory device or storage medium, it causes enough ionization as it passes uh, to significantly alter the charge state of the memory cell, and then you will have uh, that effect. Uh, okay, and then of course malicious activity. And this comes from a variety of sources and in a variety of shapes, but in practice it's not very really so before we learn to defend that data, we need um, to introduce um, the way in which modern computers actually operate that data. And it's more of a formality. You must have seen or heard about it uh, somewhere. But on the off chance that you didn't, Boolean functions. So in a computer, all data, including decimal, including floating point, including text, uh, is actually stored, as you know, as strings of ones and zeros. And Boolean functions are elementary functions that manipulate those ones and zeros, out of which we then build everything else that uh, does more complex things to them. So as an example, a function called not is a function that takes a string of ones and zeros and converts all ones into zeros and all zeros into ones. The reason it's called not is that these ones and zeros cannot just be interpreted as such, they can also be interpreted as true and false. So let's say we assign true to one and assign false to zero, and then these strings, they become logical statements about some facts or some data, and then not simply says negate, right? Something that was previously considered true is now to be considered false, and the other way around. 
Now, there are more complicated functions in this class. Not operates on just one argument, but there is a collection of two argument functions uh, that are used in comparison. So, say A and B, and we will write down all possible combinations of A's and B's. They could both be zero, so both false. One of them may be true, or the other may be true, or both of them may be true. And then the basic functions that operate on them are as follows. We can ask whether or not both are true. And the corresponding function is called M of A and B. And it's only true when both are true. So false, false. Therefore, false, false, true, false, true, false, false, true, true, true. So only in the situation when both are true does the function return true. We can ask a different question. We can say, is either of them true? And that's called or. And so false, 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 true, one of them is true. This or is that. Therefore, true, true, false, true, and true, true counts as true, but either A or B. <coughs> and then there's a special kind of or which corrects for this last strange case that when both of them are true, we still consider the or assignment to be true. It's called exclusive So that is true when either of them are true, but not both. So when both are false, it's false. When one is true, it's true. But when both are true, it's false. And XOR, for all uh, the exotic looks, is actually the function that is used the most uh, in computer science, uh, because it's in various sense optimal. So for example, in disk arrays, uh, it is the XOR that is being used. And uh, everything else uh, is a combination of this. In fact, if memory serves, it's sufficient to have XOR and NOT. And everything else is a combination of them. Uh, but these are the elementary functions that computers are using. OK, so now that we know what it does, we can build on these functions, or we can at least refer to these functions, because everything we will be talking about ultimately manipulates the digital data like this. So what is our actual problem here? We need to be able to, at the very least, detect, but ideally to also correct and attribute all of this that goes on. It would be nice to have some kind of function that serves the role of a watchdog. It sits there, and it watches the data, and if anything at all changes in the data, you know, any bit, anywhere, then that function is supposed to raise a flag. Now, pleasantly enough, fortunately enough, very elegant class of functions exists that actually does a flag, and these are called functions. They do exactly what the name suggests. They're a kind of mincer into which your data goes. And then it produces um, a diagnostic output called digest, which has this watchdog property. So um, the diagram for it would be, let's say, we have a data set. And it could easily be in the gigabytes and terabytes, so very, very large gigabytes to terabytes. And it's called a message. And the name comes from the old days of cryptography, where this would actually have been a message sent by some other person or something. So the hash function that is calculated from this is quite short, typically 128 bits. Uh, it's called a digest, and it is produced by the hash function. And hash 
functions have the following properties. I will first list those properties and then I will discuss them because they are uh, both philosophically and mathematically quite <coughs> So the first property is simple enough. Uh, it says that any hash function that is useful in practice must have linear complexity with respect to the size of the message. So if a gigabyte took us a second to digest, then two gigabytes should um, this is done because everything has to be scalable, right? You and I might have, I don't know, a JPEG file with 10 kilobytes, uh, but somebody over at NASA will have 10 exabytes of data from some telescope. And if, if the complexity of digesting these messages goes, for example, quadratically with the size of the message, then of course it's game over for NASA. So it has to have linear complexity. gets interesting. Any modification at all, right, even if a single bit lives somewhere inside the gigabyte, any modification of the message is, and here we encounter the funny term, almost certain. Property C related, any two different messages are almost certain to have different digests. This is 2 to the minus 64, which is approximately 5 times 10 to the minus 20, if I remember it right. So overwhelmingly low probability. Not an impossibility, but it is not impossible that that might be the case, just grossly unlikely. And you can see how such an algorithm would not give us any absolute guarantees that the data has not been modified. It would only give us probabilistic guarantees. And here we go into another philosophical discussion of what constitutes acceptable probability. Now, clearly, that is a function of how much risk you are taking. 
we are taking and what is the consequence of uh, not detecting that wavelength. If the consequence is a nuclear power station blowing up, you would have one probability threshold. It would really have to be uh, hard. But in the case of just a, a bit clipping, you know, in the picture of a kitten somewhere on the internet, nobody cares right, the degradation of the images. So the actual decision making has to be based on the product of cost and probability. Uh, if the costs are high probability, it has to be proportionally low. If the costs are moderate probability, we can tolerate uh, high probabilities. Uh, what constitutes a negligible probability uh, is actually um, bitterly ironic uh, in, in practical engineering. There is uh, annual statistics published by the Office of National Statistics on the probability of suicide in Great Britain. I think about uh, 1 in 10,000 per year, and so it's about 10 to the minus uh, 4 to 10 to the minus 5 per year. And the rule of thumb used by engineers is the negligible probability is the probability that's smaller than the probability of your own suicide. Uh, which, sort of, if you think about it, is uh, rather gross, but uh, probably a reasonable estimate uh, of what constitutes uh, a probability of an event that you can realistically ignore. <coughs> So a car crash is above that probability, uh, but being killed by a meteorite is below that probability, and so this is how we decide what is significant and what is not. Okay, so then on the different messages, if the two files are different, then they are supposed to have different digests with the same probability here. And then uh, given a digest, it should be impractical to find the message, and uh, the difference between the A and the Z here is significant because the message can be in the gigabytes, but the digest is only 128 bytes. There are clearly a lot more messages than there are digests, and so there will be multiple messages that will have the same digests. It's just the probability of finding them has to be negligibly low. So a hash function, a valid hash function, has to be such that if we know the digest, we shouldn't be able to find any message that has that digest with respect to this hash function. So it should be easy to calculate forward, but next, impossible to calculate backward, even if it's not single value backward. So not just we shouldn't be able to find the message, we shouldn't be able to find any message with that hash function, not without an extensive search. Now let's take a look at what the extensive search is going to be like. With these properties in question, we will have to test, because of the probability estimate, the order of 2 to the 64 different messages before we have a chance at what's called the hash transition. So I need two messages with identical digests or having a modification that doesn't change it. That's 5 times 10 to the 20, to minus 21 over, uh, and of course, uh, this is too much, right? Only the biggest supercomputers on Earth are starting to approach this, and because of that, in fact, much of modern computer science has switched to 156 bit uh, digests in their hash functions, which imposes an even steeper criteria. So basically, that means too hard. Uh, and the barrier here isn't so much probabilistic, it really is economic. By the time that you have acquired a computer that can actually do it, you've probably spent more money than you spent to gain from breaking that hash to begin with. Uh, and uh, technical obstacles are rarely absolute, uh, but economic obstacles actually often because by the time you've got enough resources, there's no point doing what you set out to do because it's too expensive. Okay, now, how are these hash functions used in practice? The first um, usage case we've just discussed, and I've got a couple of examples of hash strings in your handout and a schematic of an MD5 hashing algorithm. It's obsolete, it's no longer used, but it's sufficiently simple to give you an idea. So, use a chart. 
Well, the first one we've just discussed, data integrity control, but there are other usage cases. One is storage of passwords. Imagine that somebody breaks into the iSolutions data center tomorrow and steals the domain controller that contains all of your passwords. Are all of your passwords now compromised? Well, actually, no. Because our IT support is clever and what they stored was not your passwords. They stored the hashes of your passwords. They took your password, they added a random string to it called salt, they computed the hash and they stored the hash. Let's see what's going to happen. When you are authenticating at any online system, it's trivially easy. You enter your password, iSolution server hashes the password, compares it with the hash that it already stores. If there's a match, okay, authenticated, you're in. So in order to check the password, it's sufficient to know the hash because you, you can compute it. However, any um, malicious actor that stole substantially a collection of hashes cannot actually reverse those hashes. It's possible to check if any given string is your password. But given the hash, it's next to impossible to actually recover the password. And so when such data are compromised, if they've been stored and processed correctly, passwords are not compromised. People with colossal computing resources can recalculate enormous databases of hashes, you know, of all the common passwords, they're called rainbow tables. And those sometimes allow them to glean or guess by brute force what your password might have been. But uh, that is only possible in situations when your password hasn't been well chosen to be used, for example, in dictionary or. So storage of passwords using their hashes in the event of server compromise does not actually give away your password. And this is the current uh, standard for how passwords should be stored anywhere, always as hashes never as text. Uh, then various things like database search. Imagine I have a database of some astronomical data where the sizes of the records in the database are in the megabytes or gigabytes, but in practice even you know tens and hundreds of kilobytes are already um, hitting this problem. When you are querying the database, what the server has to do is to compare your query with every element of the database. It's a bit more efficient than that because the database is sorted, uh, but it has to compare gigabytes, megabytes, uh, sometimes exabytes of data. Clearly a tough problem. What it can ask you to do is it says, well, you've already got the data. Why don't you hash it? Uh, you hash the data, you give it the hash. It has an internal a table of pre-computed hashes. The only thing it needs to search is a hash table, which, because the hash is tiny, uh, is also quite small. So searching databases with respect to hash tables of data rather than the original data is actually way more efficient. So you will find a lot of databases certain mechanical databases where data is structured, for example, smile strings are canonical, but you will be searching not the actual smile string, not the actual NMR spectra, you will be searching the hash strings of some descriptors that you have separated. And so that's, that's the second use of that. And uh, the third, uh, and a really funny use, and we'll get back to it in a few minutes, uh, is cryptocurrency money. Funny. Imagine uh, the following. You need a computer to perform a certain hard calculation. And you need to have a guarantee that no corners have been cut, that the CPU time has in fact been expended and the hard calculation has been done. What you can ask your user or your computer is to find a message that corresponds not to a particular digest because it's next to impossible, but you can ask it to calculate a message that satisfies a certain pattern in the digest. For example, the first 20 bits have to be zero. Uh, the rest of them can be anything. That's considerably easier than reversing the hash. 
and can only be done by brute force because of the false property of these hash functions. <coughs> right? so even in digest, you cannot guess the message except by just searching for all the possibilities. That's called mining, uh, at least in Bitcoin. Uh, there are other ways uh, to generate group of work algorithms, but that was the original one. And actually, it wasn't invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. It was uh, around way earlier when people were trying to find ways of combating spam. Uh, as you know, it's trivial easy to send emails to billions of people. And the thinking was, at uh, an early stage, is before sending an email, why don't we ask uh, the sender's computer to do some hard calculation? People who send five emails a day wouldn't mind, but people who send five billion emails a day would run out of their computing power, and so spamming would become economically unviable. <coughs> For various reasons, this never took off, but the proof of work algorithm is based on hashing has actually uh, been later used as the proof of work algorithm in Bitcoin. In there, it's not MD5, I think it's SHA, a different hashing algorithm, but the principle remains the same. Okay, now, where does this go wrong? Hashing is useful in that it will detect all of this. If your disk begins to degrade and starts making bit flips, uh, various file systems like ZFS from some microsystems, they've got their own built-in integrity control that's based on these hash functions. And at some point, your laptop will simply tell you, hello, your disk appears to be making errors. We don't know why. It could be mechanical malfunction. It could be electrical, but that disk is dodgy. Why don't you replace it before it really kills over? And this is what However, in the case of malicious activity, what is conceivable, of course, is that people who are seeking to alter your data will alter your data, but then recalculate the hash, overwrite that hash string, and then you would still not be able to detect it because the data remains consistent with its hash. Even if you print it out and store it in a safe, certain nations do have the resources to actually currently crack into that safe and replace the piece of paper. Right? So we need uh, integrity control that is specifically resistant to that kind of tampering, but at the same time has the property of these hash functions in so far as its ability to detect the difficulty of the calculation goes. And that's the next topic for today, that's called digital signature schemes. And this is again something you have clearly seen on the internet and the BBC. So item four, digital signatures. And if you've ever worked with a mass spectrometer or an NMR spectrometer, you will remember uh, there will be an option uh, when you save the data, it says digitally sign. Uh, either the instrument signs it or you sign it with the, the cryptographic keys that you provide. And that provides hard guarantees as if your data hasn't been tampered with uh, in certain situations. Okay, so what is a digital signature scheme? The first thing we need to do for this is something called the key generation algorithm. And I will be simplifying massively here. Many such things exist, but the simplest possible such scheme uh, requires two large prime numbers, let's say n and k, large primes. And I will remind you that the prime number is the number that doesn't have any integer divisors beyond itself. <coughs> One. And there are plenty of primes, so if you take all the numbers up to n, there's n divided by log n uh, primes between 0 and that number, and so finding a very large prime is actually quite easy. And the second thing we want is a signing algorithm. Basically, for all intents and purposes, a hash, right? So it has properties of hash, but requires these two large numbers. <coughs> and the last thing we need is the checking algorithm.
Now, the beauty of it in this very, very simple uh, and also very much simplified case is it needs only the product m times k to be refined. Let's think about it. A Russian submarine sails under the Arctic Sea. Right? Six meters of ice. Water is not transparent to almost any radio frequency. Uh, communication is very, very difficult. Extremely long wave radio that can be intercepted by reaching any, pretty much anyone on the planet. When they sail away, either they generate these two large primes, or, or somebody in Moscow gives them those primes you know, in a big black box. And then any message that the submarine communicates to Moscow, it can sign and append this hash string. And for that, it needs the two individual primes that it has. In order to verify whether the message came from that submarine, the authorities in Moscow and anyone on the planet only needs a product. However, the multiplication of two large primes is notoriously irreversible. Given a number that is a product of two large primes, it is impractical in the same sense as here to actually find out what those two large primes have been. So anyone can verify that the message belongs to the person who signed it, but only the person in possession of these two primes individually can actually generate that signature. So, the two primes individually are called the private key. And you hold on to it for dear life, not give it to anyone, store it in a second. But their product is called the public key. And you can disseminate it as broadly as you like. So, store this, send this to everybody else. Then any message you have signed, anybody can verify that it came from you, but nobody can forge your signature unless they found a way to factorize large numbers, which is famously, at least to civilian mathematics at the moment, impossible. So that is the very basic, very simplified digital signature scheme. And uh, maybe I've simplified it a little bit too much in here, but at least there is a function that's irreversible, uh, and the irreversibility of this function is the basis of this algorithm. Okay, so usage cases. The most obvious ones and the most annoying ones to you is digital rights management. DRM. You know perfectly well that a pirated DVD with a game is unlikely to play in PlayStation 4 if you simply just copy it on a computer. That is because the authentic DVD is a digitally signed by Sony Corporation. Uh, and the private keys that are required to generate that signature are stored somewhere in a safe in Tokyo. Uh, but every workstation and every PlayStation that is sold on the market comes with their product, that's the public key, so every PlayStation can check some of the original signature, but none of, none of them can forge it. And so you would not be able to play pirated DVDs. The same applies for, for example, the music and uh, the videos that you download from iTunes. You have all had difficulties getting certain computers to play certain videos from iTunes. That's because of incompatibilities in the implementations of digital right management. Uh, based upon these schemes. So essentially, digital signatures prevent uh, media from being played or executed at uh, the uh, hardware that cannot verify the authenticity of either so or the media. Second, boot protection. In a computer, Intel Corporation releases digital, digitally signed firmware for its computers 
and the CPU checks every time the computer starts the validity of that digital signature. If the signature is invalid, chances are the firmware has been tampered with by some virus, and goodness knows what. It will refuse to sign. Uh, it will refuse to run it to print the message of digital signature invalid. You know, would start. Uh, this is what happens when you are trying to install Apple's operating systems on a laptop that's not Apple, so-called hacking crashes. Uh, you know perfectly well that even though both classes of systems are Intel, both classes of systems are mutually compatible, and if it's so wanted, um, Apple's operating system certainly would run on the laptop, just they don't want to. And the implementation of I don't want to run on your computer is based on digital signatures. So something in your system hasn't been digitally signed by Apple, or something refuses to sign a message that the operating system requires, your credit card is open, for example. So when you do contactless payment, in fact, what is done is your little electronic card digitally signs the authentication message that uh, goes to Visa that then processes the payment. Uh, okay, author identification. If I have digitally signed a message in a certain way and all subsequent messages are signed with the same set of keys, that is possible to establish, and so you can actually uh, cryptographically demonstrate that this overwhelming probability of error messages came uh, from the same author. And finally, uh, we covered the mining process for cryptocurrencies in there. Uh, so cryptocurrency transactions crypto actually a cryptocurrency account is simply your private key. Uh, sometimes a hash of your private key um, combined in a way with, with your public key. So what is known to the blockchain is your public key, and sometimes the hash of your private key. So nice of which discloses your private key. And then when you submit a transaction into the blockchain, you sign it with your private key. Um, everybody else on the network knows your public keys. They can verify that the transaction actually came from you. And if people do not know your private keys, then they cannot do anything about it. So only a person in possession of the two individual clients can make transactions in the name of a particular account. So if you install the Bitcoin graphical user interface, the first thing it will do is it will generate your private key, and hash it in a certain complicated way, give you that hash, and that hash is called your receiving address for the cryptocurrency transactions. So this is where this is being used. And I've brought in your handout uh, a schematic of Bitcoin blockchain uh, and the chain of signatures and hashes that goes uh, into it. So take a look at it. It's um, perhaps too technical to really discuss it on the board in this lecture. Okay, so the summary of today is that um, because chemistry is moving steadily towards computers and all of these blockchains and digital signatures and so on are only just starting to be used, but this will um, go on in the, first of all, protection of the data that has been generated by almost any serious physical chemistry instrument these days, from uh, a GCMS system all the way to diffractor, diffractometers and NMR machines. All the data that comes out of them will be digitally designed. So you have to protect from data degradation. And uh, unintentional degradation is served well by the hash functions, which are just glorified and really complicated combinations of these Boolean functions with the property that if anything at all changes in here, even if we try hard, then uh, the digest would almost certainly, with overwhelming probability, change. And then we notice, and either we replace that hardware before it fails completely, or we invalidate the data because the data is no longer reliable. In situations when your data is corrupted by malicious activity, the only way of trying to detect that is by using a more sophisticated version of that called digital signatures, where uh, the function with the properties of a hash is derived from um, certain uh, private 
he could be primed, could be something else. Um, discrete logarithms are, are another good example of irreversible one-way function. But essentially, you have the private key that allows you to sign, and you distribute the private key that allows, the public key that allows everybody to check, but it does not disclose your, your private key in the process. And the usage cases already established in digital rights management and group protection and identification uh, for the originator of a particular message. Uh, and increasingly, if uh, you uh, watch the BBC long enough and then Google around, things like Bitcoin and Monero are using uh, the private uh, key authentication uh, and uh, digital signatures um, in uh, processing uh, their transactions. Now, Bitcoin blockchain is a bit uh, iffy because it's highly traceable. Right? Your, your private key is actually um, when, it's, when it's used for signature, you have to append the public key and then uniquely discloses uh, you so it can be traced. But there are newer cryptocurrencies like Monero, which are uh, much more private uh, and for all practical purposes are traceable. Okay, uh, well, hopefully that's interesting as. Uh, an indication of the things that the chemistry department is currently doubling on the mathematical side of things. Um, any questions?